in the myth of Kiluch HaKolwen, Kiluch longs to marry a maiden named Olwen, but her father, Aspadaten Ben Kaur, sets Kiluch a set of seemingly impossible tasks for him to complete before he can take her hand in marriage. One of these tasks is to hunt down a boar named the Turch Truith, and in order to hunt down the Turch Truith, they must first find Mapon Ap Motron. In order to find Mapon, Kilhoch seeks out the ancients of the world, ancient animals who have seen all things. One by one, the ancients of the world tell him they cannot help him, and to seek out an animal older than them. They seek out the blackbird of Kilguri, who leads them to the stag of Hredanvra, who leads them to the owl of Cum Cowlwit, who leads them to the eagle of Gwernabwy, who finally directs them to the salmon of Hin Hugh, and the salmon knows where Mapon is. The salmon, an ancient creature, takes them down the Severn River to Caer Loyu, modern day Gloucester, where Mapon has been kept prisoner since he was but a baby. Mapon, or perhaps you may have heard it mistakenly pronounced as Mabon or Maben. Nowadays, this word evokes imagery of autumn, of the turning of the wheel of the year for most modern-day pagans. But for those of us with a Welsh persuasion and perspective, we know Mapon to be more than simply a festival on the neo-pagan calendar of revelry. Hello and croeso, welcome to this, the Welsh Witch Podcast. My name is Mara Starling, and here on this podcast we explore the magic of Wales. This episode we are diving into Mapon. Who is Mapon? What role does he play in Welsh lore? And how did his name become associated with the autumn equinox? Joining me in today's episode is Chris Hughes. Chris is a teacher and she shares her passion for Celtic mythology online via courses, blog posts, videos and more. She's a devotee of Mapon and Maponos, which is one of the reasons I asked her to come on to speak to me today. Now a quick little message or kind of offering for you at the beginning before we move on to the proper episode. Chris has a class coming up which focuses entirely on delving deeper into Mapon and Maponos. It is called The Mysteries of Mapon, and will explore an in-depth exploration of the different aspects of Mapon and Maponos, their links and how Mapon became associated with the autumn equinox. Now, that class will be held on Saturday, the 2nd of September, so it's coming up soon, and it's just in time for the Autumn Equinox as well. Details can be found as to how to register for this course and such on Chris's Facebook page and other social media pages. Uh, You can find Chris Hughes' social media pages under Go Deeper on most places. All the links as to where to find Chris, her YouTube channel, her Facebook page, her website and such, will be in the show notes or the description below. But you could also head over to Chris's website at godeeper.info. That's godeeper.info. And check out what offering Chris has for you in the run-up to the Autumn Equinox, or Maybon, as some people call it. So let us now dive into the myth, lore, and divinity of Mapon. Welcome, Chris, to the Welsh Witch Podcast. How are you today? I'm fine, Mara, and it's just great to be here. I'm really excited about this. I've, I would love to talk to you for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that you agreed to come on and specifically to talk about this subject as well, because I think the minute I decided I wanted to do uh, an episode specifically on Mapon, you were the first person to come into mind. 
because you yourself have various connections to Mapon and Maponos and all of those lovely things. And we'll get into that as the episode goes on. But I was just wondering, just to get us started and get us into this episode, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got mixed up into this weird and wonderful world of all the Celtic kind of goodness? Well, I started out as a child. Now, seriously, though, I have to say this. I, I had a strange fascination for everything to do with Britain and Ireland as a child. And that didn't come from my parents. In fact, I think they were quite puzzled by it. Uh, I was particularly drawn to Scotland. And I started out my adult life as a musician. And I was increasingly attracted to traditional music. And I moved to Scotland in the early 1980s. And ended up as really like the main accordion teacher for Scottish music in Edinburgh for like the 25 years that I lived there. So I just sort of went native, as they say. I just wanted to assimilate into the local culture. Now, teaching wasn't quite what I imagined I'd do. You know, I thought I'd end up playing in a famous folk band. And actually, teaching really suited me. And I really loved teaching adults in particular because they're always there by choice. They're always motivated. And I also became interested in honoring Celtic deities around the same time that I moved to Scotland in the early 80s. So Edinburgh has ah, the most wonderful libraries. It was a great place to start researching mythology and who were the deities of pre-Christian Scotland. Celtic polytheism as such wasn't really a thing yet. So Scotland has several different layers of Celtic culture, as I'm sure you know. The, the culture of the early Britons is strong, the same culture that built Wales. Parts of Scotland were kind of Brythonic holdouts against the Anglo-Saxons uh, for a few centuries. Then Goidelic culture came in from Ireland, bringing the early Irish language, um, cultural material from Ireland, gods, folk practices. And then there were also ties with Gaul especially in the, in the South, I think, where, you know, where I lived. And as a result, I probably seem a bit like polycultural to some people uh, because gods from all these different cultures feel very imminent in Scotland. Oh, definitely. And I think if if I were to ever like get you on again, if I could ever convince you and drag you on here again, I would love to get you on to talk specifically about those kind of Brythonic connections between Wales and Scotland, especially because it's a, it's a topic that I'm not too overly familiar with, but I am familiar enough to be like, hey, we're cousins. We, we have a link. We have a shared similar culture there. And I know that you talk a lot about it on your um, various platforms as well, which gives me a lovely segue to kind of mention that, that if anyone has an interest, I know you've spoken about the, you know, the Erhen Ogled and Irene Freged and all of these kind of topics that people could dive into if they have an interest in learning more about those aspects of things. But, you know, beyond your passion for this stuff, you also teach about it, as you mentioned, you have a love for teaching and such. And I was just wondering if you could let us in a little bit into what drew you to want to start sharing so much? Like what what drew you to want to start things like the Go Deeper blogs and the Facebook groups and such that you run and all the videos that you put out? What drew you to want to do it, not just yeah. as something for you, but something that you could share with the world as well? Very much so. So I moved back to the US from Scotland about 14 years ago. And I played a few gigs at first. I was still kind of trying to do the music thing, but I actually didn't enjoy it. I think I was a bit burnt out on music at that point. I had just done wall-to-wall -wall music my whole life. Uh, but it's very different playing Scottish music in Scotland and playing it in the U.S. People have different expectations and they respond differently. And it just wasn't for me. I didn't get the feedback that I had gotten in Scotland. I got good feedback, but it was just different. It just felt weird to me. So I had bought some land at the time. I was also working with horses. So I just got on with that. Then that all fell apart, as things sometimes do. And I ended up moving again. And this time I went to Oregon, which is where I am now. Both of the places that I've lived in the U.S. have been really rural and isolated. I don't live in a, a city. I don't even hardly live in a town. So the Internet's been a big 
thing for me as far as staying in touch with my friends and communicating with fellow polytheists. The enormous distances between things here are just, you have to have quite deep pockets to travel between places. So as internet infrastructure got better, I started teaching mythology classes on Zoom because I really missed teaching, the act of teaching. And there wasn't enough potential students to learn Celtic mythology where I live. And I really wanted to get back to that. And I could see there was a huge need for it in the pagan community in particular, and I needed to be earning some money. So I just thought, well, here's a here's an opportunity for me to give people something that they seem to be hungry for, but they seem not to know how to find the way into. I can relate to that entirely as well, because like for me, um, I I first kind of came onto the internet to share stuff because I had a frustration that I couldn't find as much as I'd like to, especially within my interest, which was more welsh witchcraft specifically the more kind of yeah, there's a lot of witchy content out there shall we say but there was not that much within a welsh context that had uh shall we say native expression to it there was a lot of stuff that was claiming to be welsh not quite welsh but there wasn't that much that was within the native expression so uh i, I kind of relate to you on the idea that like you know, there was a need for it and there was obviously people who were looking for it. And for me, when I was looking for content to fuel that fire of mine, when it comes to my passion stuff, you were one of the people that I found. So it's almost surreal now to think that we're just sat here having a chat, <laughs> considering that like a few years back, we didn't know each other that well and or, or at all, possibly. And that I was just watching your videos in my living room, like with my tv screen screaming youtube so i i'm really glad that we now are at this place where we're, we're, we're doing the work together almost and i love it and there's more people now thankfully as well um another question that i kind of want to get you to answer for me if you don't mind if, you, if it's not crying too much before we move on to the topic of today's episode is to do specifically with your expression of say spirituality or polytheism so usually around this point in the podcast I say to people well you know this is the Welsh witch podcast are you a witch so I guess I want to extend that question to you now is is you you've already kind of teased that this is more than just you know you're not just interested in the stories from a place of enjoyment from a place of entertainment it's they mean something more to you so I was wondering if you could give us a little insight into your personal I suppose practice or devotional life however you want to refer to it right well I'm not I don't identify as a witch but that doesn't mean I've never done a spell you know but it isn't my main focus magic isn't my main focus um, the occult or esoterica isn't my focus. It just isn't. But the gods are very real to me. I'm, I'm a religious fanatic if you're looking for a label. <laughs> so teaching mythology is a form of devotional work for me. I don't really feel called to teach how to do paganism classes very much. Um, I do it a little because people keep asking me, but I never really feel relaxed doing that. But I've done a lot of deep study of myths and historical stuff. So I feel that's where I can help people the most, because I feel if they don't know what's in the lore, then they're building their whole practice on shifting sand. So my spiritual practice is difficult to describe. I, I didn't have much contact with other polytheists pre-internet, we were a pretty rare breed, and I never happened to get involved in Wicca or witchcraft. I just didn't. So I just started worshipping certain deities and praying to them. I've been a polytheist for 40 years. You know, it's just when I hear myself say that, I just that sounds crazy. But it's it's the truth. I've been praying and making offerings. But my practice to this day, it's it's a bit formless. I actually dedicate most of what I do to the gods, the teaching, the writing, the YouTube videos. It's also people can have better information about the gods I love and to keep their names and stories in people's awareness. Now, when I lived in Scotland, I had a really intense relationship with the landscape. 
not so much uh, going to so-called sacred sites because really those are pre-Celtic, you know, uh, but just, uh, I spent a lot of time outdoors because I worked with horses and this and that. And, and I walked a lot of the same walks repeatedly. I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you walk the same path several times a week over years, that kind of thing, which of course you do when you're on farms working with horses and animals, it's like the, the land knows you and you know, the spirits of the land and, It's interesting how I feel like the gods plug into that as well. Like they know where you're going to be. And it's, it's just intense. But here in the U S I had a bit of a relationship with the land. So I, the place that I bought the land in before I got here was where I grew up. It was near where I grew up. And I do have a relationship with that land. And because I own this big chunk of land and I tended it and I rode horses on it and I drove tractors on it. And, you know, I was on it every day, like, you know, square foot by square foot. I knew that big acreage. I did have a relationship with the land, but it's not the same relationship I have with the land in Britain. And I think it's because I can contact the gods here, but they're not imminent in the landscape for me. Now I can't speak for other people, not very often. And here in Oregon, for whatever reason, maybe because I'm not from here, I don't know. I have zero, zero relationship with the land, but mythology, when I'm reading the stories of a God, I can feel them like over my shoulder going, yeah, look at that bit. Read that sentence again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Oh, definitely. I, I especially picking up on the what you said about how um it's almost like when you walk in certain places you can feel not just you having a reverence for the land but the land almost getting to know you because we were having um so me and my friends not too long ago we were having me and my polytheistic friends the ones who are also you know lunatics as i am and uh we were having a conversation about the concept of hiraith uh, in the welsh language and how Hiraith is something that we often find really difficult to explain and fully like contextualize for people who are not from the culture. Um, you, you try and explain it and people go, Oh, so it's homesickness then. And you kind of have to go, No, it's, it, it's not really, but yes, there's an element of that, but not really. It's something else because it's also grief and it's a longing and you can trail off all these words to describe it. And a friend of mine turned to me and he went, Um, you know, one thing I think people don't acknowledge with Hiraith is it is the fact that you're missing the land that you're from or that you're missing a certain land that you've connected with, a certain place that you've connected with, a certain location. But it's almost like that location, that place, that piece of land also misses you. It's like you can feel that. And yeah, that's to me a huge element of it too, because I, I'm i very guilty of being very... Um, much the type of person who posts pictures of places like Brinkahide and Treviknath and Baklode de Gaures, which are these really ancient, beautiful sites that we have along the coast of Anglesey, um, because they are lovely places to visit. But my favourite places tend to be things like there's the little coastal paths that meander around. Uh, so the village I grew up in is both a, a farming village and a coastal village. So you've got these like footpaths that meander between the coast, so the beaches and the fields. So you've got fields on one side with cattle or horses or sheep. And then you've got the sea to the other side of you. And to me, those kind of like serpentine paths that meander around the coastal path are the more kind of where I feel home. And it's it's hard to Instagram that, but it's where I live emotionally, I think. And I can definitely relate to that feeling. I can't quite relate to the feeling of um, North America because I've never been. <laughs> but uh, I'm curious because I have spoken to a lot of people who live over in North America and they have said that, you know, that there's this there's this feeling almost of not being able to connect and also this little voice that goes, am I even allowed to connect? And 
it's so complicated and it really it's curious to me and it's something that I can't fully relate to. So now that we've kind of covered who you are and what you do in some capacity, we can kind of move on to the very topic of this episode, which is quite a touchy subject for some, I, I believe as well. I think um, I I was a bit nervous doing an episode on the, the topic of Mapon because last year, around the time that, um, you know, we celebrate Mapon within the Neo-Pagan Wheel of the Year, um, I often make videos across social media about Mapon and how it's pronounced. I, I'm very, I'm a stickler for trying to push how it's pronounced. That's a big one for me. And I often get really angry comments and such in response. So yeah, this is going to be a fun one, but also hopefully people will listen to the episode before getting too riled up <laughs> or trying to accuse us of such. But you know, this episode will be re released around the tail end of August or the beginning of September. And at the end of September, pagans in their droves will be gathering uh, at open rituals, at intimate gatherings, with their covens, groves or groups or however they refer to them, or at their altars, if they're just solitary practitioners as well, just to their altars alone, to celebrate the pagan festival of Mapon, or, or to be a little salty about it, as I've heard, the pagan festival of Maben, Maben. <laughs> As a Welsh speaker, um, it was really weird when I first came into paganism, because when I first kind of, we all, I think, if if you come into paganism through the more kind of pop lens of it, you're going to come across those kind of illustrations of the Wheel of the Year and such, and these things that people tell you, you know, put this in your book of shadows and all that. Um, and I remember seeing for the first time ever, I think it was some kind of resin statue of the wheel of the year. That was one of the first things I ever saw that had the word map on on it. And I instantly assumed that the pagan holiday had something to do with the Welsh entity, the Welsh being that exists, because I knew about Mapon. And even though I didn't know much about Mapon, I could at least identify that it was a Welsh word. So I always assumed it was pronounced Mapon. So it was always a bit strange when I started like listening to videos or watching documentaries and you'd see these pagans call it Maben. Uh, but we'll get into all that. And that's the theme of this episode. Mapon, Maben, what is it all? What connection does it have to Wales, if it has any connection at all? And as I, I said to you, I think at the beginning of the episode, I always associate you with Mapon because you're likely one of the very few people online who speaks the most about Mapon. You know, a lot of the, shall we say, gods and goddesses of Wales have uh, their own kind of veneration within the pagan community nowadays. You can't kick a rock in the witching community without coming across someone who's into Ariantrod or Keritwen. You, you know, Shrianon has had her little revival, not revival, she's been around since Stevie Nicks did her song, I think, in the more kind of pagan crushed velvet community. But Mapon is one that we never hear anyone talk about, except perhaps you and a few other P Welsh people I know. So, I adore your blog posts and videos and such which focus on Mapon, as it offers a great introduction into this um, kind of figure who's often overlooked in favour of the pagan holiday. Uh, and I very much recommend anyone listening go watch and listen to those as well. But if you would be happy to do so, could you give us a little introduction into who Mapon is for you? Right. Well, okay. Now, I must correct you. In the United States, it's known as May Bon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. May Bon, not May Bon. <laughs> May Bon or, or May Bon. Yes, because that O-N ending is really unusual in English and, and Americans are just like, don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so you can add that to your list. <clears throat> yeah, Mabon. So I didn't know about Mabon. He didn't register with me for quite a few years. I read a lot more Irish mythology early on than I did Welsh because it was strangely more available. But I had read, um, you know, all the Mabinogian stories, but <clears throat> Kilach and Olwen is such a, uh, a big thing, you know, it's a big chunk of words. And Mabon didn't really register with me, I guess, when I first read Kilach you know, back in the 80s. 
and then I was uh, headed off for a holiday. I had had a, I won't go into all my personal past here, but I, I'd had a kind of weird experience and I'd been a, a neo-pagan for years. I'd been a polytheist for years, but I'd, I'd always been kind of st- a little stuck and couldn't quite get over that feeling that there was anything beyond apparent reality. You know, there was anything beyond the materialistic world. So I just, you know, I went ahead, I worshipped the gods, I made offerings, I read mythology, I did all what I was doing, but there was always just a little bit of a um, a thing in my head going, how the universe is laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> and then something happened, which... Uh, convinced me beyond all shadow of a doubt that there was something beyond apparent reality. And I was also going through some crap at the time in my personal life. So I decided I needed to get away. I lived in Edinburgh. I thought, "Mm, I'll go down to the borders. I always usually went uh, to the islands, to Isla or somewhere. I thought, I'll just go down to the borders and looked for a holiday cottage, found one in Loch Maven. Mm -hmm. And a couple of people said to me before I went, oh, yeah, you're a pagan, aren't you? You, you know, that a whole area is associated with Maponos or Mabon or something. We don't know really what. And I kind of went, oh, that's interesting. And I thought, well, Maponos, no, he's a he's a Roman god, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't at a very, this is late 90s, I guess, mid 90s, maybe we're at. I wasn't very informed yet. <laughs> Anyway, I went, I stayed in this cottage by myself and I was having a grand time, but I wasn't alone, you know? And I really felt um, Mabon, Maponos, Mabon reaching out to me there. And so that was the beginning for me. But anyway, to tell people who he is, now that I've said who he is for me, now Mabon's name occurs in Welsh literature, like I've said, in a story called Kilhoch and Alwyn, and as a place name around the Solway Firth, which is at the western end of the border between Scotland and England. Can everybody see the map that's there in the air in my mind? <laughs> so it can be difficult sometimes to decide which of the characters in early Welsh literature represent deities and might come from an earlier mythological layer of Welsh culture. But there's really quite broad agreement, even among scholars, that Mabon very much fits the profile of deity. And that's certainly been my experience. He's real. As for the modern holiday, I never heard of it until, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, because I was really very out of the neo-pagan loop for a lot of, the, a lot of my life. So It turns out it was coined by a Wiccan author from California in the 1970s. And he was creating a calendar and wanted names for the solstices and equinoxes because he was using the, the sort of goidelic Irish names for the, for the other four. So I think he's also responsible for Litha as the summer solstice. And I'm rather well known for objecting to the use of Mabon's name in that way, primarily because it's rare that the celebration of the day involves honoring Mabon, the god. Mabon has a story. He has lore. He's a deity. And yet most people just think, oh, Mabon, isn't that like a pagan harvest festival? So if that author in the 1970s, who, by the way, was a fairly well-informed individual. He has a degree in, I think, theology. If he had called it Mabon's Day or something, it might have left the door open for people to ask and be taught about who Mabon is. People would be telling his story in Wiccan circles right now, you know, but as things stand, it's it's more of an erasure of Mabon et Podron because when your name gets turned into a kind of brand name like that, people stop seeing you. They only see the brand. They don't see Mabon the god. They just see like cornucopias and pumpkins. 
Oh, sorry, I'm ranting on. No, it's perfect. I I kind of um, think that the only reason I know who Mabon is at all uh, before I started, you know, getting into Welsh mythology at the level that I am now, the obsessiveness that I have now with reading as many translations and as many versions as I can. Um, before I got a bit obsessive like that with um, Welsh mythology and the Mabinogi and the further tales beyond the Mabinogi, the only reason I think I knew about Mabon was because when I was in school, in primary school, we had a a little kind of, I, I went to a school that only had about 25 students in total. It's closed down now because the council absolutely hate little schools for some reason. I loved it. It was the best upbringing, going to a school where the teachers focused entirely on you. Uh, and I remember when I first started primary school, one of the first things I said to my teachers was that I loved fairies and mermaids and witches and all of these things. And they instantly kind of clicked that, oh, that means you're into fairy tales and folklore. So they would direct me towards the more Welsh stuff. My One of my teachers, Miss Owen, I owe a great deal to her because she was a huge proponent, proponent of the Welsh language, the Welsh culture, Welsh mythology, all of it. It was very much like, oh, you like this Disney film with a mermaid in it? Well, here's a folk tale from down the road with a mermaid in it. She was that type of person. And I loved her for it. Um, I remember I was obsessed with The Worst Witch, um, the book series. And she kind of instantly took me and went, oh, you like that English book series about a witch? Well, here's one called Ralarutins, which is a Welsh version. And also, have you read the story that involves Keritwed? And that she introduced me to a lot of these characters through that. And there was a book that we had in our little, I wouldn't call it a library. It was more like a little book corner that we had. There was a book that was an illustrated version of the tale of Kiloch Um, And it was, I think it's by Gwyn Thomas. And it, it's got these beautiful illustrations. And on the very front cover of that book, there's the picture of um, Kiloch, and I think it's Arthur, sat upon the salmon, which is jumping over the walls of Caer Loyo. And Mabon is on the inside, on this little island in the middle of the River Severn, looking up at them like, oh my gosh. And that picture really like cemented itself in my memory when I was a child. And I remember constantly asking the teachers, who are these? Who are these characters on this thing? And they would always tell me, well, it's Kiloch and Arthur and Mapon, you know, and the Salmon of Knowledge, the Salmon of Wisdom, or an Aeog um, Clover or something like that, my speech used to call it. Um, but because of that, Mapon kind of cemented himself into my brain, but I never registered who he was. Like, I never really got on with the story of Kilo Hakolwen. In the previous episode of this podcast with Jenna, I literally was talking to her about how, you know, for me growing up, a lot of these stories I considered boring because I I didn't do like we didn't do much to do with like Shakespeare and such when I was in secondary school doing my GCSEs. But we did because I went to an all Welsh school, a school Bedetter, and again, which really, again, really advocated the Welsh stuff to the point where you would get punished if you spoke English in the hallways, even. Um, we would spend a lot of stuffy kind of summer days reading things like Kiloch Akolwen in our Welsh GCSE classes, which to me back then was torture. Nowadays, I look back and I'm like, I should have paid more attention, really. I should have really buckled down then and just gotten on with it because I probably would know more now if I had just taken it. But you know, if you're forced to do something as a teenager, you're going to rebel against it. So to me, Mapon never really clicked. And it was the holiday that kind of veered me back towards him kind of because I remember the first time I ever heard someone call it Maybon um I I had a bit of a what is that <laughs> I, I don't know what that is um and I wanted to make myself more knowledgeable so that if somebody asked me well what what is Mabon then if it's not Mabon and it's not just a harvest festival what what is Mabon and it's really hard to decipher it if you only have Kiloch Golwen to look at. But luckily now we have people like you who do talk about it in more detail. And I think the first question I would I had when I first got into Mabon um, was specifically about his full name. So within the texts, he's referred to as Mabonap Motron. 
And app, um, for those listening who might not be aware, is essentially like a version of Mab, which means the son of. And it's interesting that he's basically double barreled because Mapon also has that Mab in it as well. So Mapon Mab Motron, which essentially means like Mapon, the son of Motron. And I think in my early teenage years when I first got into paganism, Motron interested me more than Mapon did. And nowadays it's flipped. It's kind of reversed. I kind of, we don't know as much about Motron as I would like to know. But nowadays I focus so heavily on Mapon that I've kind of neglected Motron. So I want to get back into that. But I'm just wondering if you could give us a little insight into who Motron is and why Mapon is related to her. Why is he the son of Motron? Yeah, sure. So Mapon, or sorry, Modron, the, oh, those two words just <laughs> love to. So Modron is Mabon's mother, not his father. And in Kilhoch, we're told over and over, it's almost like a mantra that Mabon was stolen from between his mother and the wall when he was three nights old and nobody knows where he is. But that's all we learn about Modron in that story. But she also has a really interesting story, which turns up in the Triads of Britain and in a manuscript with the romantic title of uh, Penny Earth Manuscript 147. And the story concerns a king called Irian of Hreged, who lived in the 6th century in much that same area up there. <laughs> <laughs> of the Scottish English border, where the place names uh, associated with Mabon are. So anyway, the story is that Ilian was summoned to a ford where the local dogs were barking and they saw something uncanny. So the people thought, but nobody could see what the dogs could see. So I guess as the bravest guy in the area, you know, sending for Irian seemed like the safest plan. So when he arrived, the dogs all stopped barking. And Irian it doesn't say what the people saw at that stage, but Irian could see a woman standing in the river washing. And he had sex with her. And then the woman identified herself as Modron and said that she was the daughter of the king of Anuvan and thanked him, saying that she had been destined to wash there until he came and got her with child. Now, that child was not Mabon, just to be clear. She actually presented Irian with twins, but essentially this story presents Modron as a sovereignty goddess, conferring sovereignty on this great king, Irian of Raget. But Modron seems to have been reinvented as a Christian saint called Madron, who has churches and holy wells and things named after her in Wales and Cornwall and Brittany. But many of St. Madron's stories contain echoes of the goddess's story. Particularly her son is always a very important part of her story. And I think and I'm not alone in this, that it's quite likely that there's a relationship between Modron and Hrianon. Uh, but that would be a lot to dig into right now. The question I always get asked whenever someone has an interest in Modron that I never know how to answer because I'm not that knowledgeable about this and I'm going off script now. So do let me know if um, this is something you also have no idea about. But it, it's one that I get quite often when people have an interest in Motron. They ask me, well, Motron has, you know, her name is is very similar to Matrone. So there's associations and cognates, like ideas there. But does she have anything to do or could she have any connection with that idea of those triple kind of Matrones that we see sometimes? And the Matrones are something that I, I'm aware of, but I've never really looked into. So I'm just curious if you have any insight on that. Okay. Um, yes, but I'll qualify that with I'm not totally solid in what I'm about to say, but I'll do my best. So matrone ending with AE is either a plural or I think a kind of genitive of matrona sometimes. But there is also a, a goddess called matrona, uh, who was the tutelary goddess of the river Marne. And there is evidence for 
uh, nematon and so on dedicated to that goddess. And yes, obviously the name means something like great mother. And there certainly are these three goddesses known as the matrone or these figures. I assume they're goddesses. But I think it's very easy to get mixed up because um, that even that inscription to matrona in the the Latin, it's A-E because it's like the genitive, because that's where her, uh, that means it's in the, in the sentence on the inscription. It's like, it's saying the place of Matrona or the, the shrine of Matrona. So it changes her name. So there is a goddess, a single goddess called Matrona, who is almost certainly connected to Modron. How closely Modron would be connected to the triple goddesses, I don't see it so much myself, um, either in my fields. You know, I don't feel it in my waters or in my study that that's necessarily the same thing. I think those are something else. So for anyone who wants to explore Mapon, Kiluch Nolwen is likely the first place they'll go and be directed to usually. And it's a good starting point, I think, even though Kiluch Nolwen is, once you start getting onto that trip, it's going to take you a while, I think, to go down that route. But where else beyond Kiluch Nolwen could people go if they want to learn more about Mapon or maybe even Maponos and all of that? Well, there are <clears throat> a few references to Mabon in other Welsh texts, but they're, they're quite, they're quite small. So you're not going to learn a lot about him. Uh, like in the poem, Who is the Doorkeeper from the Black Book of Carmarthen, uh, he's referred to both as Mabon ap Modron and as Mabon ap Mecht, M-E-L-L-T, which means lightning. So this is possibly a reference to a deity who might have been his father. And he's mentioned in the triads as um, a divine prisoner. So that's a really important part of Mabon's identity is being this divine prisoner. So when, when they're searching for Mabon in Kilhoch and Alwyn, uh, they're searching for someone who can't be found and who's been missing for eons. So they go to all these animals. They're supposedly the oldest animals. And each animal tells how it's so very old. You know, forests have been cut down and new forests have grown and things in their lifetimes. And yet they don't know where Mabon is. So there's this huge emphasis on not only that he's a divine prisoner, but he seems to be have been imprisoned almost for eternity. So there's something very special and spiritual going on there. And they eventually find him imprisoned in Gloucester Castle on the banks of the Severn. So there are many kind of mystical aspects to Mabon's story. And we don't have time to go into all that. But the fact that he's associated both with dogs and hunting, so the reason they're looking for him is because only he can handle a special dog that's needed to uh, make the quest successful that the whole story is about. So he's really the linchpin. So he's got this association with dogs and hunting and then this divine prisoner thing going on. But as I mentioned, there are also these place names in Scotland um, this, there's a town with three lochs surrounding it, which is called Loch Maben. So Maben is the Scots uh, pronunciation of Mabon, the modern Scots pronunciation. And there's also a, a standing stone, which is associated with him, called the Clach Maben Stain. And those are like two of the best known place names in the area associated with Mabon. And so he had uh, also a cult in that area to do with Maponos that probably lasted from the time the Romans arrived, maybe till sometime after they left. It's hard to say for sure. So to study Mabon, you have to sort of go here and there 
There's not going to be one source, <laughs> except nerds like me. It's almost like you have to become Keloch and do the whole hunt for the Tuchtroith, just to understand Mapon. Yeah. Just go the width and breadth of all the Celtic nations and figure it out. Uh, going off of what you were saying about him being this almost divine prisoner, this this idea of him being imprisoned constantly, I think that's a good kind of segue to ask a little more about his associations with the holiday of Mapon within the kind of uh, wheel of the year, as some call it. So one thing that I've noticed um, from those who are a proponent of saying that Mapon is a name that we can associate with the autumn equinox at the end of September is this idea that his story is similar to the story of Kor or Persephone in uh, the kind of Hellenic tradition. And the idea, you know, that Kor or Persephone was stolen away from Demeter um, and taken down into the underworld, where once she was under there, Demeter, who is this kind of goddess who rules over the land and such, she stops producing any crops and the land decays. And obviously it's kind of like this, I'm not big on the Greek mythology, so I might be saying something wrong here, but essentially it's the story of why winter exists, you know, because Demeter is missing Persephone and she's weeping and grieving the loss of her her stolen divine child, this divine mother grieving the loss of her divine child. And I've heard people say that that is the reason that Mabon is called Mabon, that or Mabon is called Mabon, <laughs> is because um, that there's a parallel there between Modron grieving Mapon and Mapon being lost. And during the period of when he's lost, it's the winter and such. But I suppose the big question that many would have then is, well, does that actually work? Does he have anything to do with the autumn equinox? Is there anything within the story that implies it does fit with the concept of the autumn equinox? And, you know, would there be any reason for us to believe that perhaps he has associations with the season of winter and the decay of the land and such? Do you think there's anything in that? Well, I guess if you look hard enough for a connection between two things, the human mind will find one, you know. And and uh, yes, absolutely. The guy who chose the name was comparing Mabon to Persephone, but I think on a pretty superficial level. So he has said uh, publicly that he was looking for a story like the story of Persephone, but he was like trying to keep it kind of Northern European. Why? I don't know. Uh, I suppose because he was already using the four fire festival names from the sort of Goidelic tradition uh, that he wanted, you know, but Litha is kind of made up and, and Ostara is Germanic, and, you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. He could have called it Cory and been done with it, you know, and it would have made a lot more sense, I think. So I think comparing Mabon to Persephone is pretty crazy. I've heard some people say he's associated with hunting and, Autumn is the main time of year for hunting, but it's really later in the year that that starts anyway, and it goes all the way through the winter. And, you know, so that's not really, that's not really going to hold water either. I think the whole thing is a big stretch. And I've also heard people getting really, really worked up because they think Mabon belongs to spring or he belongs to the winter solstice. Like that's very big in the Neo-Druid tradition. And I don't happen to agree with those ideas. I just, I don't really see Mabon as a seasonal deity at all. Pagans can get, you know, me included, can get kind of obsessed with creating calendars and seasonal connections. You know, we need a, we need a theme for our altar. We need a theme for our ritual for these eight wheel of the year times, which I, you know, I celebrate them too. But I think we get a bit desperate to fill in every blank space, you know? And, oh, who can we put there? Oh, well, we can't put that because, you know, that's Hellenic or we can't put that because whatever, that's not the gods we worship. And so they're desperate to find something from their culture or something to put in there. And I think it's a very artificial construct sometimes. So my own take is it's, it's just not, I don't see that connection. 
but I'm I don't object to people celebrating Mabon at this time of year. That's not a problem for me. I think I agree. It's just I I've done so last year. Um, being who I am and being down with the kids and very cool, I'm on the TikTok. And I uh, made a few videos last year about Mabon. And this is where I started to rile some feathers. I started to get people really mad because one of my big kind of arguments was always, you know, I don't mind people calling the holiday Mabon so much. Um, and I, I don't mind that it people can place that if, if it makes sense for them onto the holiday if they want to associate Mabon with that time of year then I kind of go you know so long as his name's being spoken and his story's being told but that's where the issue lies isn't it is that his name isn't being spoken because people are saying Mabon or Mabon or a version of it that isn't quite the pronunciation that we would use within the Welsh language today or within the Celtic languages today and also his story and his identity as a deity is almost overlooked by the idea instead of this very kind of uh I, I was I would say very basic idea of a harvest festival you know I often this is where I probably might get cancelled by people for saying this but I do think sometimes that as pagans we're really obsessed with the harvest even though to us in a modern sense it doesn't really mean that much because it's not like we're out working the fields is it <laughs> we go to Tesco so it doesn't really work as well but at the same time I like that we do acknowledge these traditions and these uh, practices that did happen at one point, and we still acknowledge the moving of the seasons. So I've always kind of argued that there is a place for Mapon, and I think it would be nice if Mapon was celebrated in that way. But what I would like to see more of is more people, I suppose, talking about Mapon, the entity from Welsh mythology, talking about his story and why perhaps we would reference it at this time of year or yeah it is this time of year now <laughs> by the time this episode comes out and also you know I, I suppose giving a little nod perhaps this is the Welsh nationalist in me coming out giving a little nod towards Welsh culture as well and Celtic culture in general in a broader sense just giving a little nod towards that aspect of things because I've even heard some people say that it's a word that comes from Ireland or that it's a word that's an Anglo-Saxon word and I, I often kind of have a moment with that but one of the biggest thing that riled people's feathers um, which I was really shocked about. I wasn't expecting this to be the thing that people got mad about. Was me recommending that people at least learn how to say his name in the way that we do. So when I said to people, you know, it's Mapon, it's not Maybon, it's not Maybon, it's Mapon, uh, because we say the R, uh, the A, like an R, uh, so Mapon, which I think even for compared to some other Welsh words, I think mapon is quite an easy word for non-Welsh speakers to pick up. You know, mapon. It's quite simple. It's not like I'm asking them to say is it? I'm saying mapon. But people got really, really defensive about that. And I remember people getting angry at me and saying, um, you're being rude because it's just a dialect difference because we're American and you're British and that's different and all this. So I'm wondering, like, I know that's a lot, this is going to be a big question now to ask, but uh, what do you feel about kind of all of that, The what I'm saying about how, you know, Mabon being associated with this time of year isn't so much of a huge issue for me, but at least, you know, maybe harken back to who Mabon is and at least learn how to say his name. Is that fair in your eyes or am I being a meanie Welsh nationalist? No, you're not being a meanie Welsh nationalist because I'm an American. <laughs> Uh, I might also be a bit of a Welsh nationalist, but <laughs> and a Scottish nationalist, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm also a bit of a language nerd, and I'm interested in things like accents and dialects, and you know how language evolves. And there is a difference between having an accent, like I have this weird accent, you know, kind of mostly American, but kind of Scottish too, because of my life history. But most people, you know, everyone has an accent. Like I can hear that you and Christopher are from Anglesey, for example, as opposed to other Welsh people I know, you know, who are from the valleys or who, who are from, nor you know, inland northeast Wales, you know. Um, everybody has an accent and everybody will 
pronounce words a little differently. But there is also such a thing as just pronouncing something wrong. So, for example, I'm going to take your name, for example. So as somebody who speaks a fair bit of Gaelic, the mm-hmm. Scottish Gaelic, your name looks like Vara to me, you know? And uh, for the first few months that you came across my uh, awareness a few years ago, you know, when you started to be on social media that I look at, um, I thought, who's this Vara Starling? She must be Scottish. <laughs> Because Scottish people, that would actually be the, the, like the genitive form of Mara. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people name their kids. They use the genitive form of the name in the hopes that people will say the name right. It's, it's a mess. It's crazy. So still once in a while, when I see your name written down, I, I, my, my brain will say Vara, but I know your name is Mara. So I can't say, Oh, well. You know, I have this Scottish influence in the way I speak, so therefore I'm going to just call her Vara all the time. That's bonkers. I know now that your name is Mara, so I pronounce it Mara. So there, there is always a range for accent and dialect. Uh, when I say Welsh words, I don't always say them with a perfect accent. I'm aware of that. Uh, I'm always striving to do better. Now, that's partly because as somebody who's always teaching and on YouTube, I had better strive to do the best I possibly can. So if you hear me butchering a Welsh word, please send me an email, Mara, (laughs) (laughs) and say, you know, here's a sound file. Please listen to it (laughs) because I want to say things correctly. And I think that that's, where we should all be, especially with names, especially with things that are national icons for a country. It's not hard. They're just saying, no, I refuse because I'm used to it. That's really what's going on. Mm. And it's just, it's not cool. Mabon, you know, he's, as you said, he's an important, if you don't expect, accept that he's a deity, you know, if that's where your paganism is at and you don't worship him, that's fine. And if you don't want to tell his story, well, I can't force you to tell his story. But if you don't want to do these things, if you don't want to say Mabon correctly, or at least, you know, try to come close, um, you know, he's an important literary figure and a bit of an icon in Welsh culture, small one, but they're nevertheless. And people need to respect that. And if you don't want to respect those things and just Celebrate the equinox or harvest and leave his name out of it. Yes, exactly. And that's always been kind of the end quote that I've always ended with whenever someone does come to me and say, says, well, I can't say Mabon. I don't know why they, they wouldn't be able to. I can't say Mabon. It's impossible because of my accent or dialect. I always say to them, well, first and foremost, like if you're saying it Mabon or Mabon or anything like that. At least that's still closer than Mabon, name Mabon. Um, and you know, that would be an accent difference. But at the same time, just say autumn equinox then or fall equinox. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing in my mind is, you know, just say fall equinox because at least then that makes sense to what you're celebrating as opposed to Mabon. And I think I get really touchy because of the fact that the Welsh language does go through what it goes through anyway. You know, I, I remember going to university and having people from mostly from Europe, mostly people who were from, say, um, Germany or Poland, who were international students at my university. They would often argue with me and say, well, Wales isn't a country. Wales doesn't exist. Your language isn't a language. It's a dialect of English, things like this. So because I'm still aware of attitudes like that, of ignorance like that, I think I'm a very big proponent in like, no, let's, you know, for for a language like Mabon, uh, like Mabon, like Welsh, for a language like Welsh, I think it's important to try and, uh, I suppose, push the narrative that it's important to preserve what we can of a language that's already gone through so much suppression and so much uh, ignorance in the past and still does to this day. Uh, and sometimes people try and catch me out. And I've always found this funny because sometimes I'll do a video like this. I know I did a video not too long ago where I said, 
about this whole map on pronunciation thing. And there was one person who was very, very cross with me about it. And they went back to one of my other videos where um, I think I said the name Hecate like Hecate because I was talking about the Shakespearean version. And when people talk about the Shakespearean Hecate, you know, from Macbeth with the three witches, they tend to say Hecate. So that's kind of stuck in my head that it's Hecate in the Shakespearean context. But I still say Hecate or whatever when I'm talking to witches who honor Hecate. And they commented on my video very snarkily going, if you're going to be um, so like condescending about Mabon, then I'm going to correct you and say, you're saying Hecate wrong. It's actually Ekati. And I was like, okay, thanks. Now I know I can correct myself. I can say it correctly now, Ekate. Perfect. And if in my accent, it would probably be something along Hecate. So yeah, okay, I'll stick to that from now on. And they always think it's a catch me moment. Like, you know, oh, you're saying that name wrong. So I'm allowed to say your name wrong. I'm like, no, because once I know better, I will aim to do better as much as possible. So yeah, it, it's a tough one. And it's such a strange situation in general. And I've had people from both sides kind of push the argument. I've had some people say that, um, you know, it's really, really important to preserve the name of Mapon because he's so important to Welsh culture. And there is a part of me sometimes that goes, he is, in my opinion, very important to Welsh culture. But if you went and asked, you know, Gladys down the streets, if he's important to Welsh culture, she might not agree that he's as important as someone like David Yuan or something like that. Yeah, or or even Bladeus or somebody mm. that's just got a higher profile I, I know. <laughs> but still, it's important to preserve these things. I just think, oh. you know, I love that phrase, when you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. And and I struggle sometimes with pronounce. I've taken, I have taken videos down because they're a few years old and my pronunciation of a name or something has been corrected and is much better. I've heard native speakers saying it, whether, whether this is an Irish name or a Welsh name. And I've actually taken the video down and said, well, I'll remake this and I'll put it back later, you know, when I have time, because that's awful. It makes me cringe now. And, and that's, that's the attitude, you know, if to all you listeners out there, if you, uh, if you don't like the way I've pronounced a name on one of my videos, leave a comment. Um, and, uh, or if you know how, email me a sound file. <laughs> That's even better. Just make sure you're a native speaker if you're going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And I suppose to end that part of the discussion, because I feel like I'm just ranting now about <laughs> getting people pronouncing things right and such. I think. For me personally, the reason I get so irritated by people who get annoyed at the request that you at least try and pronounce the name right is that as a Welsh speaker, I do try and provide, you know, the, the, the knowledge of how to do this. I sit there in front of my screen and I, I recite the word map on like map. Bon as slowly as I can so that people can pick up on it. And I put all this labor into it just for people to go, well, no, I refuse because my accent or something like that. It does sometimes feel like, you know, why do I bother then? What's the point? Uh, and it is a, a strange one. So like, it's, it's a strange topic in general, but that would be as my kind of closing statement about this whole map on thing, uh, the holiday specifically it would definitely be a case of my personal opinion about it is that I don't personally mind that people refer to the holiday as Mabon, but I would like to see maybe it change to be pronounced Mabon as much as possible if people are able to and they know better. Or if we're not going to have anything to do with Mabon, maybe just say Autumn Equinox or Fall Equinox instead. I don't see what's so wrong about that. But anyway, I I've kept that conversation going for too long. So I just, I suppose I wanted to ask as a closing question before we wrap this up, how would somebody, if they were to devote themselves to Mabon, as somebody who does devote themselves to map on what are some things that perhaps they could do or could look into or could even set up if they wanted to build a devotional relationship with map on well i think my experience has been that he's um especially i'm in the lucky position of now knowing a number of devotees of map on 
is that he's a very approachable, very approachable deity. Um, his uh, Gaulish, or not really Gaulish, his earlier counterpart, Maponos, I haven't spoken about Maponos, so I'm just going to detour for a moment, is, is strongly associated with healing and also with um, hunting and with music and poetry. And so there's a lot there. And I've found it's quite easy to get in touch with Mabon Maponos in meditation, in that kind of thing. He likes offerings of hazelnuts, I have discovered um, quite a lot. I like to eat hazelnuts and I daren't walk past the altar with a handful. <laughs> I feel this little, <clears throat> <laughs> can I have some on the altar, please? Which is just, it's lovely, you know? Um, and I know some people find that kind of thinking very fanciful, but that's what I feel. Um, I would say if you are looking for somebody um, to help you with Emotional healing or anything like that, he's a brilliant deity to reach out to. Um, I'm not sure if that's quite what you're asking me, so please try again if I'm not getting at what you're asking me. No, not at all. That's perfect. It's just the case of I know I've had on occasion in the past where I've um, done the odd video, because though Mapon is someone that I'm interested in and intrigued by. He's not a deity that I particularly devote much time to unless the situation arises. So for example, um, and when I say situation arises, I think that was a conversation that I wanted to have with you at the beginning, but I forgot completely. And maybe I'll have to do maybe a round table discussion on the podcast one day about polytheism, where we can talk about these discussions and these um topics but you know one thing that i struggle with a lot is moving away from a lot of the witchcraft world and a lot of the modern pagan world tends to look at deities as correspondences almost as like they're they're things to use rather than gods to worship and that is something that i'm unlearning because i went through the pro the period of my life where I got very used to the way that people talk about gods. You know, it was very much like, oh, you, you call upon Hecate when you want to practice magic. You, you call to Keritwen when you want to use her to get divine inspiration and things like this. And there was always a sour taste in my mouth with that kind of stuff. So when I say that I call to M Mabon when the need arises, I don't mean like, oh, when I need to cast a spell and he will help me. What I mean is, so for example, last year around November time, I went down to Gloucester to Caerloyo and we were doing, of all things to do in Caerloyo, we were doing a ghost hunt in a, in an abandoned prison. It was a fun weekend that was planned with a bunch of TikTok witches. Um, and it was a fun time to meet some people that I'd met online. So I went down to socialize and to be among some people that I'd met online. But luckily on some like, lucky fluke the prison that we were doing the ghost hunt within was right on the banks of the river seven and so i went down and i had a moment with the river seven and i said a little poem as an offering to mapon because i associated that place with mapon um, because of his association with it in the story and because it just just being there without even thinking too much on it my mind instantly started recalling the idea of his story in Kaidaloyo, um, of being trapped there and such. And so I recited a little off-cuff poem that I wrote down on my notes app on my phone because I didn't expect to be next to the river. And it was seeing the river, seeing, and in that specific location, the River Seven flows quite quickly, quite rapidly. So seeing the river instantly made me go, oh, I need to do something. I need to give something to Mabon or, or to recite something for Mabon here. So I wrote a quick poem and I recited it for him and I just sat there for a while and I thought about the story and reflected and it's that's what I mean when I say like my relationship with Mabon to present has been more so of a oh the need has arisen right now I'm very fortunate lately that the River Seven uh Avon Havren it's playing a much bigger role in my life lately because I'm quite close to it here where mm -hmm. I live now um so he does pop up even more than usual at the minute um but specifically like that's kind of my relationship so it was nice to hear 
a little bit of insight into how someone who devotes more so to Mabon than I would, would build a relationship with him. Because I know that I've had people in the past reach out and say, well, now that I've learned who Mabon is, I want to, I want more. I want to get to know him better. So thank you for sharing what you did about hazelnuts and such. And I suppose yeah, it, 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 you, you could maybe see the, the question kind of stopped me in my tracks a little when you asked, because I was like, I'm mainly a devotional polytheist. I was like, well, you just, you just worship. <laughs> How hard can it be? <laughs> I, yeah. So I don't really do the correspondence thing much either. Yeah. It's, it's a strange one. I'm, it, it's because I am unlearning it because my introduction, I know this is a tangent now, but I think people listening would enjoy this is that like my introduction into paganism and witchcraft as a whole was very much through initially it was just being mentored through um, a friend of mine Julie and then I met Christopher not long after that and a lot of that was very kind of intuitive and ecstatic when I first started being mentored mm-hmm. into it and then when I moved away for university that's when my path kind of veered a lot and I I, I I relied very heavily on books because a lot of my practice before that was very community focused. And it was very much like um, Julie would message me and say, we're going to a burial chamber and we're doing some magic and we're going to do a ritual. And we're going to connect to something and we're doing this and doing that. I'm going to take you over to the cliffs and we're going to learn about the herbs that grow along this coastal path so that you know how to connect to the landscape. It was that kind of thing at first. Mm. So when I lost Julie, because I was, I moved away, I went to a university in Manchester, Metropolitan University. And I didn't have Julie. So I kind of lost my footing and I was like, wait, I don't know how to witch without Julie. I don't know how to do this thing that I do without Julie, without the Anglesey Druid order there to go to, to have rituals with. How do I do this alone? So I relied very heavily on books and a lot of the books do focus very intently on, you know, this idea of almost this correspondence list of how to use the gods within your magic. So even now I'll catch myself sometimes I'll be like, oh, I, I hear the call of, say, Rhiannon uh, at the minute. And, oh, gosh, I don't have a shrine to Rhiannon in my room at the minute. And I feel like I should. So I'll go to myself and I'll go, I need to build a shrine to Rhiannon. OK, what's Rhiannon associated with? And it's mm. coming out of that mindset of like, oh, I don't need to think about that. Just let it be. Let it be intuitive oh, in a way. Like, just have a moment and think, like, what is already in this room without having to buy things? that I could associate with Rhiannon and maybe set up on a little desk with a little bowl, give offerings to her and spend a few moments just looking at the altar or the shrine that I've set up. And that's enough. You know, I don't need to go out and buy certain herbs that I think are associated with her or buy a tablecloth in a certain colour because this book says that she's associated with that colour and all this. So, yeah, it is unlearning that, I think, at the minute and just allowing the relationship to forge because that's kind of how I'm seeing my polytheism at the minute is less of a um, kind of almost relationship that's based on what I need and what I want and more of just a relationship as if it was a friend or someone that's in my life in general like I'm becoming more familiar with them in the same way that I would become more familiar with a new friend so I'm learning about them and they're learning about me so it's a reciprocal kind of relationship but also one of devotion because obviously they're gods <laughs> but yeah it's hard to put into words <sighs> i think they do need to learn about us and that's um i'm sure you've found this as you have devotion to more deities if you're reasonably uh steady in that devotion and you keep it up you'll find more deities going there's somebody who as a devotee, would actually show devotion. And I I certainly find that as a writer, I think sometimes uh, they want me to write about them or they want me to teach about them or, you know. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that, especially at present. Oh my gosh, I I should give a little spoiler now maybe for my patrons who will probably watch this before anyone else, but I've gone on a huge rabbit hole over the last month looking into what – in a lot of kind of Welsh pagan circles, people call the kind of three ancestral deities of like Hyr and Belly Mawr and Dawn. And 
I I think my devotion sometimes comes out and expresses itself in the form of questioning things. So mm-hmm. like um, when I first learned about Mabon, it was instantly that question of, well, who is Mabon? And where does he come from? And what do we know about him? And when it came to these, like, I, I had someone message me, I did on Facebook, asking me about Hir and Dawn and Belly Maur. And I said to them very honestly, because I am not kind of, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too proud about trying to come across as an authority 24 seven. So when people message me and they go, I want more information on this, I'm very happy to go, I know nothing about that. Sorry. <laughs> like, here's a person that may be. And I think I, I sent them over. I said, um, maybe go check with Christopher Hughes, Chris Hughes or Gwilym. I said, go, go ask one of those three. Cause I don't know at present. I'm not quite secure enough to know yet. Um, and they asked me a question about, these three kind of ancestral deities and what makes them ancestral deities and why are they connected to land, sea and sky as the Druids say. And I sat down and I think I was with my partner and I said, you know, those questions have been playing on my mind now for months because I don't know the answer. And I feel like I should, especially at this present moment of my life, I'm currently doing some stuff in the background, which includes uh, a little bit of devotional work towards Belly Maud, Dawn, and Here. Now, Here is one that's always been there in my life um, because I grew up on the coast. So, from the minute I met Christopher Hughes, and um, he kind of, I read one of his books, I think, and I read about Here, and I knew about Here because Branwen read Here, but I never clicked who he was. And I remember going on a deep dive and learning about how here is used within um, kind of medieval Welsh writing as a noun just to mean sea, just to mean water. Mm-hmm. And so him to me made sense as, an, as a water or a sea-based deity and being on the sea. And specifically, I grew up in the village of Abifrau, which Branwen got married in Abifrau. So Abifrau is kind of a place that I associate with the children of Hir and Hir himself. It's a coastal village and it's mentioned in the second branch of the Mabinogi. So it kind of like I, I built a connection with Hir straight away, but from a very basic level where it was just, I see Hir as the sea and he is very rooted in this location and the, the Irish sea I consider very Hir for some reason. Um, and so I built my relationship just on a very kind of intuitive level like that. So here, I was kind of like, I can make sense of here in some capacity, but Belly Maur and Dawn, and then nobody ever talks about Mathonwe and all these other entities that also kind of play a role here as well. And Math, you know, Math is kind of on the same level, but he's never placed as one of those high mm-hmm. ancestral deities. So I've been really going down the rabbit hole lately. And that's how my devotion expresses itself sometimes is just questioning. Like, why? Why Why is Dawn considered a land-based goddess? Why is Belly Maur the sky? Because etymologically, their names, as far as I can see, don't mean anything to do with sky or land. So where does that come from? And who are they? And why are they important? So, yeah, I, I know that's very off topic to Mabon, but... It's very much in keeping with understanding how to build, I suppose, a devotional relationship, because to me, that's how it's expressing itself lately. Not at all. I heard I heard Ronald Hutton once, you know, because people, if you go back, you know, a few decades, Ronald was much less willing to be honest about being a pagan or be open about it because he had a, a big, heavy academic career to think about nurturing. Um, but you know, I've heard him say in private, my devotional work. Yeah, it's research, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think that's he's devoted his life to researching things so that we don't have to, you know, and that's that's exactly, you know, kind of how that really inspired me in a way. Although I, you know, my my interest is a little different. My approach is a little different, but that. People aren't going to do the research, but they do want to know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, and that's a beautiful place, I think, to stop for a while and just say thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. And I could talk for hours more probably about so many things. And I'm hoping I can twist your arm or your leg or some kind of appendage at some point to have you come back on and talk about other topics. But I suppose I'll just pass over to you now and ask, where can people find you? And what have you got going on lately? And what else would you like to say before we sign off for the night? Right. Oh, okay. Well, I've got a a website. And that website is called www.go.com 
deeper.info. So getting info is the trick. Um, and if you go on that website, um, you can find out, uh, you can read. I don't post uh, my writing there as much as I used to. I post it mostly on my Patreon and a lot of it is public. So you can go on my Patreon and read quite a lot of stuff, even if you're not a patron. Um, but if you go on my website, you can also find out about classes I'm teaching. So I've got two classes starting quite soon. First, I've got a class that <clears throat> I've been teaching for years called Women and Goddesses in the Mabinagi, which uh, I guess it's kind of a feminist view of the four branches of the Mabinagi. So we look uh, in depth at Hrianon and Branwen and Bladeith and Aranhrod, but also at the more minor female characters in these stories, like who are they? What can we find out about them? And that's a really good entry point to my classes, but any of my classes pretty much are. There's not a class that I teach that you need to have taken another class to, to join, uh, but it is a good entry point. And it's also uh, a good entry to the four branches and it's pay what you can that class. So it's very affordable. And that one starts on the 30th of August. And then for the past couple of years, I've started teaching a class about, guess who, Mabon. And it's called Mabon, Modran, and Mapotmus. So I cover all three. And that one will start on the 2nd of September, so around the same time. And I also give people the opportunity to come to just the first week of that class if they want to as a standalone talk uh as a standalone event with there's some time to ask questions and it's a sort of in-depth introduction to Mabon and Maponos. And that's on the 2nd of September that starts. So if you want to find out more about those, uh, you could have a look on my website, www.godeeper.info. And I've also got a YouTube channel, which is just YouTube stroke Chris Hughes. Um, it's probably on your screen how my name is spelt, but it's Chris with a K, uh, K R I S for those who are listening to the podcast. And I've got a Patreon and it's the same patreon.com forward slope Chris Hughes. So it's easy to find me. Just Google Chris Hughes Mabon. And you- <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for coming on today. And all the links to everything for anyone listening will be in the show notes. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, it will also be in the description, depending on whether you're listening on a podcast streaming service or on YouTube. It should all be where the notes usually are. But yes, thank you once again for coming on. I'm so glad that we had this chat. And yes, to anyone listening, do check out Chris's YouTube channel and all the other amazing things that she puts out there because it's well worth a listen. Um, Thank you so much, Chris, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Oh, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, Mara. (laughs) Jochenvar. Well, Dioch o Galoni, Chris. Thank you so much to Chris for coming on and sharing her wisdom with us. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to learn more about Mapon, I would just like to remind you once again, like I explained at the beginning of the video, that Chris has a class happening very soon to do with Mapon. It's called The Mysteries of Mapon and it's being held on the 2nd of September on a Saturday. So go and check that out on Go Deeper. Dot info or via the links down in the show description. But thank you so much for listening, and I hope I will see you next time here on the Welsh Witch Podcast. I've been Mara Starling. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.